Just recently, Reuters reported the breaking news that Tesla was negotiating with CATL to make cobalt-free batteries for Gigafactory China's Tesla Model 3. And with other YouTubers putting out some really good videos diving into Tesla's possible move to prismatic LFP battery cells instead of NCA cylindrical cells, I thought it was a good time to break down the difference between cylindrical, prismatic, and pouch-style batteries, as well as how the CATL battery chemistry that they might be using will affect the Chinese Standard Range Model 3. And stay through to the end because there's an aspect of this news that I think might be a little off the mark. I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. If you haven't seen the videos that Galley put together on CATL, as well as Sean's confirmation of Tesla moving to prismatic and possibly lithium iron phosphate instead of nickel cobalt aluminum, I'll include links in the description. But for this video, I wanted to dig into a little more detail on the differences between the battery formats, how they're made, why they're chosen, and what the change in battery chemistry means, including the fact that CATL batteries don't use cobalt. Now, all lithium batteries are made up of a few basic components. The positive electrode, or cathode, is usually something like lithium iron phosphate or the nickel cobalt aluminum formula as I mentioned before. Then there's a perforated separator to keep it isolated from the negative sheet, or anode, which is usually a compound of carbon material like graphite. Finally, all of this will be filled with a liquid electrolyte that allows the free flow of ions back and forth between the anode and the cathode during charging and discharging. There are a myriad of chemical formulations for the cathode, anode, and electrolyte that have profound impacts on specific energy, specific power, voltages, life cycles, and more. And in case you aren't familiar with specific energy, it's often referred to as energy density. It's how many watt hours per kilogram the battery is capable of storing. And specific power is how much power output a battery is capable of divided by its mass. And one way to think about it is it's like your kitchen faucet. When you open the tap of your faucet all the way, how much water is it capable of allowing to flow through all at once? Specific energy is storage, and specific power is flow. So that's the basics of a battery. And I have a video that dives deeper into it if you'd like to see more, and I'll include a link for that in the description. There are three common forms you'll see most often when it comes to EVs, storage, and consumer electronics. Cylindrical cells have been around since the 1950s, and it has a few good benefits right from the top. The manufacturing technique has improved significantly over the last few decades, leading to lower cost per kilowatt hour, and the cylindrical structure offers excellent stability, which means it can withstand high internal pressures and doesn't deform or change size. When manufacturing a cylindrical battery, the cathode, anode, and separator are spread out in thin sheets, which are then rolled up like a jelly roll. Because the cathode and the anode are rolled, they have to be kept fairly thin to avoid cracking during the rolling process. After they're rolled, they're cut into segments and wrapped in a metal protective case. The shape of the casing makes them a great option for EVs because they offer extra structural stability when laid out in the battery pack. However, they aren't the most efficient use of space because of all the gaps the cylinders create. But this can actually help when designing a battery cooling system for thermal management, which is exactly what Tesla did with their liquid-cooled battery packs. There are cooling structures woven throughout the gaps that make it easy and efficient at maintaining temperatures to ensure peak performance and long battery life. Another advantage of small cylindrical cells when applied to larger EV battery packs is you're able to spread the load across a massive number of cells. We're talking about thousands of cells. This can help to extend the lifespan of the entire pack because it's spreading the load and reducing the stress on an individual cell. The battery management system can adjust and target charge and discharge rates for each individual cell to take advantage of the setup. And if a cell goes bad, you're losing a much smaller percentage of the overall battery pack than the larger format battery cells. Prismatic cells were first introduced in the early 1990s and are jelly rolled or stacked. The jelly rolled process looks somewhat similar to the cylindrical method, but the final result is a rectangular flat shape. The stacked method folds separate segments of anode and cathode between a folded separator. One benefit of this approach is that you can use thicker cathode and anode layers since you don't have to worry about the cracking during the folding process. The final battery is wrapped in a box that can be made in a variety of dimensions, but the case is important to provide structure and compression. 
Since the prismatic cell is contained in a rectangular box, it loses some of the mechanical stability of a cylindrical cell, which means it needs slightly thicker walls. This can result in a small drop in capacity, but that's made up for with a more efficient use of space compared to cylinders. However, this can make it more challenging when designing a thermal management system because it's more difficult to extract heat from the larger format cells. The Nissan LEAF uses prismatic cells and ran into problems because Nissan didn't design active cooling into their battery packs. This caused rapid degradation from their battery packs. It's a solvable problem, but something to keep in mind. And unlike cylindrical battery failures, when a prismatic cell goes bad, it means you're losing a larger percentage of the overall battery pack. Pouch cell construction made its appearance in 1995. Instead of using a hard case like prismatic cells, it relies on a laminated bag only. The big benefit of this approach is that it's lightweight, cost-effective, and can be easily shaped to fit any need, which is somewhat similar to prismatic batteries. Pouch-style batteries have the best packing efficiency at 90-95%. to However, since it's only a soft pouch, considerations have to be taken into account for swelling, pressure, and protection. They're most susceptible to heat and humidity as well as expansion of the cell. Over the years, I've heard debates why one format is better than another. Why companies like Tesla chose cylindrical over prismatic. Which must mean that cylindrical is the clear and best choice. I mean, come on, right? In reality, it comes down to cost and what's the most effective format for the chemistry and use case. For years, cylindrical cells have been the cheapest to manufacture, but that's changed recently. Prismatic cells aren't that different cost-wise from cylindrical cells anymore. There's a research paper from a few years ago in the Journal of Power Sources, written by Professor Whitaker from Carnegie Mellon University, that compared the manufacturing costs between cylindrical and prismatic cells. Different chemistries can affect the performance and cost-effectiveness of each choice. But the part that stuck out to me was prismatic cells, which have more design flexibility to account for specific chemistry characteristics, can be larger, requiring less hardware per kilowatt hour and reducing costs. Which leads to CATL specifically because they unveiled a cell-to-pack manufacturing process that no longer requires modules within the pack. The process can increase the mass energy density by 10 to 15%, improve volume efficiency by 15 to 20 percent, and reduce the number of parts by 40 percent. Those kind of gains of cell to pack will have a huge savings on the battery pack costs, which is something that Elon talked about in the Third Row Tesla podcast. Which leads me into the most interesting note from this breaking news report, which is that these prismatic batteries are lithium iron phosphate instead of Tesla's usual nickel cobalt aluminum. Tesla is known for having one of the highest specific energy battery packs in the industry which means you're packing in a lot more energy per kilogram. The benefit is a smaller, lighter weight battery pack that can achieve the same range as a larger, heavier, less efficient battery pack. NCA batteries have a specific energy of around 260 watt hours per kilogram, but could be up around 300. Cycle life is also very good at 500 to 1000 full charging cycles, but Tesla battery modules usually get around 1500 cycles. There's some downsides to NCA chemistries, though, which include cost and safety. They're more susceptible to temperature variations, which can affect performance and longevity. And they also use cobalt, which is a very thorny issue regarding human rights in some cobalt mines in areas like the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's also a very expensive element, so cutting it out would reduce costs. Tesla has been working to remove cobalt from their batteries, and their current NCA chemistry already has one of the lowest in the industry at 3%. In comparison, LFP batteries have no cobalt in them at all. Originally developed by John B. Goodenough's research team in 1996, the LFP chemistry benefits from long cycle life, thermal stability, and excellent safety. You're typically looking at charging cycles that are higher than NCA, and the high specific power and thermal stability means that you can achieve charging times similar to regular supercharging rates of around 150 kilowatts or less. The downside is a much lower specific energy than NCA batteries. Instead of 260 watt hours per kilogram, you might be looking at 120. But CATL has shown their LFP batteries capable of 190 and may be closing in on 200. The voltages are also slightly lower than NCA batteries at a nominal 3.3 volts or 3.6 volts on the high end. This ultimately won't matter too much when you chain all the cells together in the final battery pack. You should still be able to achieve the 360 volts that are needed. So what does this mean for the Tesla CATL report that they might be going with prismatic LFP cells for the Chinese Standard Range Model 3? From an owner's perspective, they shouldn't notice any meaningful difference at all. Tesla will need to account for the more challenging thermal cooling situation of the prismatic batteries, 
but the LFP chemistry handles temperature variations better than NCA. The LFP chemistry means they'll need to take up more volume and weight with a larger battery to hit the same kilowatt hours to achieve the standard range mileage. But that should be achievable with the shortest range model, since space isn't as much of a premium there. But there's a big wrinkle here. I wonder if we're jumping to conclusions about the switch to LFP because Tesla has actively been working on their own cobalt-free chemistry for a while now. Elon has been teasing some major battery news at the upcoming Battery and Powertrain Investor Day event. And we'll have more to talk about uh, this in detail in Battery Day. Like I said, probably, you know, probably April. Maybe we've got a very compelling strategy. Uh, I mean, we are super deep on cell. Super deep. And cell, cell through battery. So cell module battery. Well, like I said, we're going to talk about this in Battery Day, which is probably April. Um, and then a lot of these questions will be answered. I think it's going to be a very compelling story that we have to present. Uh, I think it's going to actually blow people's minds. Uh, it blows my mind, and I am uh, you know, I know it. Uh. <laughs> Tasmanian has a report that this may not be a switch to LFP at all based on a tweet from an official Chinese Tesla account. When asked if Tesla China would be using CATL's LFP cells, the response was, Thanks for the question. All we can say right now, please stay tuned for the battery day in April. Cobalt-free, not only for LFP. That's a pretty good rhyme. Switching between cell formats isn't trivial. It would be a very expensive jump between prismatic and cylindrical batteries if you had to retool a manufacturing line. So this is going to be a longer term commitment. And for that, I would not be surprised if Tesla does switch to CATL's cell to pack prismatic manufacturing. There's a significant cost savings going that route. But will this mean moving to LFP as well? The current LFP chemistry that CATL has is impressive, but it doesn't strike me as the ultimate formulation that Tesla is going to be moving towards. Professor Jeff Don's research team has been working on future formulations that Tesla has yet to announce. Internally, Tesla has a project codenamed Roadrunner, which is aiming for a more energy-dense and cheaper battery cell along with other improvements. Moving to LFP now would be all about cost savings more than anything else, because it's not more energy-dense. By one analysis, the Tesla pack level costs $158 per kilowatt hour right now. CATL's prismatic LFP battery will potentially save 25% in production costs. If that's true, then the cost could be around $119 per kilowatt hour. So a clear reason to move down that direction now. But just remember, CATL's prismatic cell to pack system would also be a big money saver on its own. Maxwell Technologies dry battery electrode techniques will also be a big money saver. And the yet to be announced new chemistry will be a high energy density that's also cost effective. And that's why I'm not as confident in the LFP reporting. But as Elon said, Battery Investor Day is coming in April, so we'll know a lot more then. But if there was one thing I hope everyone takes away from this video, it's that there's a lot of variety and nuance to the battery technology. Cell structures and chemistries can be applied in a crazy number of ways to achieve different results for different situations. There's not a one size fits all here. And there's still a lot of advancements being made on those chemistries. So what do you think? Do you think the initial reports are correct and that Tesla is going to move to prismatic and LFP batteries? Jump in the comments and let me know. And be sure to check out the new podcast that I started with my brother, Sean. We discussed the previous week's video and some of your feedback. You can find out more at stilltbd.fm or just search for Still To Be Determined on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. Give it a listen and let me know what you think. If you think I've earned it, I hope you'll consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell to get alerts when I post new videos. Without that bell, you might miss out. And give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and share it with your friends because it really does help support the channel. And as always, an extra big thank you to all of my patrons. And an even bigger welcome to two new Supporter Plus members, Jason Harvey and L. Stephen Lamb. I've got a lot of exciting videos in the works and your support is really helping to make it possible. So be sure to check out my Patreon page for additional details about joining the crew. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.